Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our virtual connect series, which continues with a conversation among the next generation of architectural practitioners on architecture education. Uh, today's conversation is about CU Denver architecture in the global pandemic what changes and what must not. Uh, like any arena of modern life in the last few months, uh, education at all levels has undergone a tremendous amount of change, and that's especially true in the higher education setting. So we're gonna hear from the providers of that education and the consumers of that education as to what they think their plans for the future might be and how they're adapting. You'll get one learning unit for attending today's session. You'll need to stay through the end to achieve that one hour credit. Make sure you've RSVP'd by the link in the chat to receive credit. And also, we encourage you to use the Q&A function throughout the presentation if you have questions for our speakers. We'll try to get to those um, as we go. We'll have a series of presentations from each of the individuals and then leave plenty of time at the end to address those questions. Now, to let you know who we've got on board today, uh, someone who is has recently, we, we moved to, Denver at about the same time, actually. Um, Mark Swackhammer is the, uh, uh, the, among other things, he's the at-large director on the AI Colorado Board of Directors. He's a great contributor with his peers to the work that we are trying to accomplish this year. Um, but he's probably more well known to you as the professor and head of the School of Architecture at the University of Colorado Denver. And, and for those who know, don't know, um, and I, I didn't before I came here and started doing some research, this campus is, well, first of all, it's the only one that has the accredited professional degree to be on the path to licensure um, in the state of Colorado. It's also one of the largest programs in the country in terms of granting degrees. I think it's somewhere around number 15 in the country. So that's a, it's a big school and there's a lot of good work that happens there. So Mark is going to lead off the conversation and he's also been gracious enough <clears throat> to find uh, three of his all-star students to join him. So also we have with us today, Xiomara Amaro. Hello, Xiomara. Shane Kren. Hi, Shane. And Justin Trammell. Hello, Justin. So welcome to the four of you, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Take it away, Mark and team. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's an honor to be here and an honor to, to speak to the practice community in Denver. Um, I, I wanna start out by um, just saying a few things about our program, and um, Mike, Mike introduced us a little bit, but I, I might uh, expand on that. Um, first, we're the only uh, accredited architecture program in the state of Colorado. Um, our undergraduate BS program um, is one of the fastest growing programs on the campus. Um, it's also one of the most diverse undergrad programs in the country. Over 50% of our students are uh, minority students. <clears throat> um, we're a very commuter oriented uh, school in a, in, very, in a very transfer friendly school. Many students follow a pathway through community college into our BS program. And, um, the fact that we're uh, commuter oriented and transfer friendly is something we're, we're really proud of and um, lends itself to the diversity of our program. Um, as Mike mentioned, we're a very large architecture program, um, one of the biggest in the country. Um, soon we think we're going to uh, um, uh, be larger than uh, 700 students in both between our both our, our BS undergrad and our grad programs. Um, and in the College of Architecture and Planning at CU Denver, we, uh, meaning the architecture department, makes up, we make up about 80% of the college. So uh, we're, we're a big program in our college. Our MARC program is our longest standing and uh, uh, program. It's our flagship program and, and it provides our accredited degree. It's our NA, NAAB accredited program. It's a very high quality program that balances an emphasis on theory, design, and practice with a long history of notable graduates, um, one of whom I worked with and is responsible for me coming here um, back in Minneapolis, Julie Snow. Um, it's a design build program. Um, uh, we're also really well known for our design build program, which is run by uh, Rick Sommerfeld. 
Um, it's one of the most awarded and highest quality programs of its kind in the country, regularly receiving many awards and recognized throughout the country um, for, for the work that it does. And you'll, you'll see more about what it's currently doing right now later on when Justin presents. Um, I want to also thank uh, Siomata, uh, Shane, and Justin for joining us today. Um, it's really fantastic to have students on this, uh, on this panel and on this conversation. And um, uh, they're, the, they're the lifeblood of the school. Um, these are some of three of our most uh, fantastic and engaged students. And um, you know, they're the reason we do what we do. And it, it's an honor to have them here today. Um, let's see if I can get my, slides to transition. There we go. Um, so I want to talk for just a second about uh, the, the school's why statement. Every um, effective organization, um, whether it be a corporation or an educational institute or a nonprofit organization, starts with its, its purpose, its why. And we've been working on this over the last six months, and um, it's taken a lot of conversation, a lot of debating and arguing, and I'm really uh, proud of it. The reason I want to start with this um, in, in regards to a conversation around the global pandemic and how the school is dealing with it is because this statement really um, is never more important than it has never been more important than it is now. It really is the thing that um, will guide our decision making and help us navigate through the challenging times that we're facing. Um, and I just want to go over the, the three main points in the statement of purpose and, and I'll read it. Um, you, you see it here, but I'll read it. Through design inquiry and making, we engage diverse ideologies in pursuit of an architecture open to all. Um, and I, I think all three of these points are really important and they, they uh, uh, are emblematic of who we are and, and what our strengths ha have always been, but also they're aspirational and they point to where we wanna go. Um, so through design inquiry and making, um, we're a school that foregrounds why, we foreground questions, we ask questions, and that's, that's who we are and what we're about. And we do that through the lens of drawing and making. Um, we're a school, as I mentioned earlier, that's known for making for hands-on learning. We engage diverse ideologies. Um, what that means is that we're not a dogmatic school. We're not a school that uh, is based around or focused on a single ideology, but rather we're a pluralistic school that welcomes the voices of, of many different perspectives. And then we're in pursuit, maybe the most important part of the why statement is that we're in pursuit of an architecture that's open to all. Um, architecture, both in terms of who it employs, but also who it serves, has been a cloistered um, and rarefied uh, group for, for far too long. And we're very interested in cracking it open and making it more open to, to all. And I think in light of everything that's happened over the last two weeks um, uh, with, with uh, some of the protests and um, the tragedy um, with, with George Floyd in Minneapolis, my, my former city, um, this is never more important than is never more has never been more important than it is now. This idea that we open architecture to all, um, and it's something we we don't just say we put our our money where our mouth is, and 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 we do uh, and and plan have done and plan on doing a lot to continue to make that a priority for us, both in terms of um, who our students are, who our faculty are, who our staff are, and then also who we engage with at a community and practice level. So the title of this talk, What Changes and, and What Must Not, um, is really about this global, this global pandemic. And we planned this you know, before the, the George uh, Floyd uh, incident happened. Um, and so this is really focused more on the on the pandemic, although it certainly ties in. Um, and I think the, the even the pandemic and, and um, issues around the pandemic are, are related to that incident. Um, so we're, we're focused on 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 what, what some of the things are that that are happening at the university level um, at the college level and at the department level and um, 
and how these will pave the way for changes that are going to happen over the next year, over the next five years, over the next 10 years. And for us to keep going on business as usual would be unethical and, and irresponsible of us. Um, I think the pandemic is going to change things um, uh, in, in ways that, that they'll never go back to. And um, I think in some cases, that's actually, in, in many cases, that, that's actually a good thing. Um, the business as usual way that we've always done architecture education is something that we're, we're, we're constantly critical of and constantly wanting to evolve. And this pandemic, I think, is a catalyst for us to make those changes faster. And um, I think in many cases, as I said, that that will be exciting. Um, one area where it's maybe not as exciting is in the area of resources and funding. Um, the, the, the university really receives funding from three sources. One of those is, is from the state. Um, the second is from tuition and the third is from uh, uh, investments. And as we all know, um, all three of those things are, are taking a big hit in the current, in the current situation we live in. Um, the state is at a $2 billion shortfall and the university is bearing a brunt of that uh, shortfall. Um, students, uh, this remains to be seen, but we're estimating that we're gonna have about a, a 10% um, uh, drop in, in enrollment um, because of the uncertainty that has, has uh, um, happened with the pandemic. Um, around education. And so that's going to affect our, our income and our resources. And then um, the stock market is down. And, and so our portfolio of investments as a university is down. So, um, you know, our three sources of revenue are all, are all down. So what are we doing to address this? Um, one is that we're not raising tuition and we're committed to that. Uh, we don't want this to be uh, carried on the backs of students. And um, I'm really proud that the university has stated that they will not raise tuition and the, the Board of Regents has stated that as well. Um, in the short term, uh, every staff, faculty and leader at the university is taking a, a pay cut, a furlough. Um, uh, those range from 5% up to 10%. Um, and then uh, there are a number of other belt tightening austerity measures that have to do with, um, you know, reducing overhead, um, reducing costs in other ways, uh, um, in, in, in some cases making our operations more efficient. Um, and, and, you know, this is ultimately maybe a good thing that, that we're becoming a more, a more efficient organization. Although um, as our provost and chancellor will tell you, uh, there's been uh, very, the University of Colorado Denver has been a very lean organization for a long time. And so we've always done a good job of trimming the fat and um, running things efficiently and um, compared to other universities. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're tightening even more, but it, it, it's a challenge for sure. In the long term, we're looking at things like um, changing our educational delivery models, expanding uh, the programs we offer, connecting to outside disciplines, uh, connecting better to practice, expanding our recruitment and retention strategies, and amplifying um, the, the national awareness of our program. What else is changing? Um, our education delivery models are changing. Um, we're asking questions like, what can be delivered effectively through new online and remote models? What does a completely online track through our MARC program look like? Um, maybe that's not for every student, but we think that there's an appetite for it and that it is uh, something that could expand our enrollment. How do we leverage our time when we are together uh, in more meaningful ways? So what, we don't want to just hold classes in big lecture halls because that's the way we've always done things. And, and what this pandemic is doing is it's forcing us to ask questions around if we've, if we've always done things this way, why have we done it? And if we can't come up with a good reason, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it. And holding huge lecture courses um, in big lecture halls is potentially one of those things. And how can we leverage our time when we are together physically in, uh, to, to be more meaningful for all of those involved? Um, 
In a making-centered program like ours, where and how does making occur? Uh, that's an important question for us. And I think in the fall, that's uh, the primary activity that will be on site and will be back on campus is uh, drawing and making and design studio. While the other classes like um, uh, seminars and, uh, and lecture courses um, will be uh, delivered remotely, um, asynchronously or synchronously. There are a number of different models that we're learning about from hybrid models to completely online models. And we're, um, again, trying to use our, our time and resources effectively. Um, we want to also do things like challenge the desk crit, challenge the juried review. Um, these are things that we've done for decades and decades and decades in the same way. And are they the best way to deliver an architectural education? Is it possible that some of those tried and true ways in which I learned and which many of you learned actually are marginalizing to some students, are uh, keeping some students out of architecture, are not necessarily the best ways to deliver education? Um, do, they do they further exacerbate the ha the, the the condition of haves and have nots in architecture education. Um, and so we're looking seriously at the way that we do those things and um, considering alternative ways to give students feedback to deliver education. Um, and then I would say uh, also more important than ever is challenging the precedents, the bibliographies, the syllabi, the lectures. Um, um, that we use in our courses and have used for many years so that they start to include women architects, black architects, Latinx architects, indigenous architects, and others who are not typically present in the canon of what we present as architecture history. I think, um, you know, again, this is never more important than it, than it is now. And um, we, we, we are, we're really uh, pressing and, and taking that seriously as are many forward thinking progressive educators throughout the country. Um, expansion of our programs. How might we expand our offerings in the architecture department? Um, we're looking at uh, developing an interior design program, which is really exciting. We're in the very early stages of that and we don't, Typically, those are undergraduate programs, and, um, and that's probably what it would be in our school. Um, but how, how could we deliver an interior design program that would be uniquely about UC, uh, CU Denver? What is it that makes us tick, and how would that differentiate our interior design offering from those that are offered in other places? We would be one of only two public institutions offering an interior design program in the state, so there's a big need for it. Um, we want to expand our pathways through our BS undergraduate program. Um, we're going to make that more flexible and nimble. We want to expand our pathways through the MARC program, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And we're going to start offering certificates in things like um, historic preservation, urban design, construction management, business, classical studies, design build, um, and offering design build at, at, at not just the grad level, but potentially at the undergrad level. These are all things we're considering. Connection to outside disciplines. Um, we're, de de we're developing strong connections with programs like engineering through our um, integrated construction management and leadership uh, certificate, which is a fantastic program that's actually available to practitioners. Um, I think it's a great program for mid-career practitioners. Um, it's a, uh, we're developing it into a completely online program that can be accomplished uh, through eight, through, um, four eight-week courses that uh, uh, could be uh, taken completely online. So that's really exciting. Um, and we're also uh, working on a certificate um, um, and a minor with uh, um, uh, construction management and construction management engineering. Um, and then uh, in terms of research, we're collaborating with the Comcast Media and Technology Center, um, uh, which is uh, really fantastic and exciting. We're looking at certificates with the College of Arts and Media. Um, we're looking at um, collaborations with biology through interdisciplinary research that's being conducted in my own um, Lodo lab uh, here on campus. Um, and we're in, in, in the early conversations to formalize this exchange in order to offer a certificate in biodesign, um, which would be really exciting. 
Uh, and then in SideCap, we're doing a lot of collaborative studios with landscape architecture and urban plan, urban and regional planning. Um, these, these kinds of interdisciplinary studios are, are just low hanging fruit that we really want to um, expand our offerings of and, um, and do more of. Um, our connection to practice. Uh, we have a strong connection to practice, but we think that we think that we can even make it stronger. Events like this are one way to do it. I'm, I'm so happy to be sharing everything that we're doing with you all today. Um, I'm a member of the AIA board of directors, as Mike mentioned, and it's really exciting to have the, the to, to bring that voice to the board, the voice of the school to the board. Um, we want to continue to expand and make more robust some of our programs like Portfolio Day and Career Day, um, which were fantastic this year, led by uh, Rachel Brown, um, who, who is just doing a fantastic job with um, further developing those already excellent programs. We want to expand our mentorship opportunities so that we could connect our students to um, practitioners in the community in a more robust way. Um, we want to continue to involve the practice community in, in our school. Um, so having them participate in new ways of reviewing student work, having them participate in, um, in teaching. Uh, we want to continue to, to bring in diverse voices into the school. And then um, I've made a real press before the COVID-19 um, pandemic occurred. I've made a real press on, um, on, on visiting firms and talking and listening to firm leaders um, and uh, it's been just fantastic getting to know um, many of you uh, over the last uh, nine months since I started here in August. And I want to continue to do that when I'm, once, I'm, once I'm able to do it. Um, that's been one of my favorite parts of every week. I visited about a firm a week uh, um, over the last nine months, and it, it's just been amazing. Um, one way in which we, we want to change is we want to be more, we want to uh, encourage an, an architecture that's open to all, as is in our statement of purpose. So bringing more diversity to our faculty roster so that uh, students of color um, and women have role models uh, to whom they can look up and aspire to be like. Um, this is really uh, um, essential. It's, it's, not even, it's not even important or, or a preference. It's, it's, it's mandatory and essential, and we're working hard at that. Um, uh, through our expanded ideas about expanded course delivery, we want to open architecture to those to whom architecture has uh, uh, previously been inaccessible, um, underrepresented students, first time, uh, first generation uh, college students. Um, students from other other demographics, uh, especially in our grad program. Um, and we want to create a culture inside of our school that is adaptable, nimble, resilient, supportive, and built on love. Uh, our, our, it's, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to have uh, a diverse uh, profile of students. It's another thing to create a culture that is welcoming and supportive of, of um, all students. And um, that's uh, something that takes a lot of work. Culture change is the hardest change to make, um, but it's something that we're committed to. And again, conversations like the ones that have been happening over the last two weeks are going a long way towards uh, uh, letting students know that we care, care for and love them. And then awareness. Um, through an expanded program of publications, uh, push on social media, lectures and conversations, we aim to amplify the national awareness of what an amazing program we have. Um, this is a multifaceted effort and it'll take time. Um, but our aim again is to be recognized as a top tier program nationally that's known for our focus on making, our intellectual pluralism, and again, our relentless insistence on cracking open the discipline to create an architecture for all. Um, we have a lot of things in the pipeline that we're working on. We're working on some print publications. We're working on a new website. We've been made a huge push on social media as of late, and um, we're, we're continuing to build awareness. We're presenting more and more. Our faculty are presenting more and more at national conferences and, and really being present in the national spotlight. Um, uh, several of our faculty are winning and um, soon to be announced national awards that are really prestigious and we're really proud of that. So we're, we're making a name on a national stage and, and uh, we want to continue to do that.
So then uh, what must not change? Um, of course, as I think you all would, would agree, um, architecture school is, uh, is founded on design inquiry. Um, that, that's the cornerstone, I think, of architecture education. Uh, drawing and making as a way of questioning and thinking. We, this must remain intact. We, 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 it, it's something that distinguishes us and, and, and will always be a strength of architecture education. Um, we're not a vocational architecture program. Uh, we're a program that first asks why in a relentless effort to produce future leaders in the practice of architecture. And so we must continue to foreground leading with the questions, um, leading with questions in everything that we do. Um, we're making focus. We want to uh, have a, uh, we're, we have a clear strength in our school in making, and so we we want to ask the question: How do we focus on this and continue to even improve on it um, when it's already as good as it is? And we have ideas about that. We'd like to expand it to our undergrad program, and we'd like to uh, uh, expand our making capacity, um, our making facilities, and the resources we devote to making. Um, and so we must continue to support our design build program and expand the national awareness of that program, which is already considered one of the top probably five design build programs in the country. Uh, we are a very diverse and inclusive program. We have a, a, a beautiful diversity in our undergraduate program. Um, that will uh, soon have a profound impact on the practice community in Denver. And we're really proud of this. It's only about six, years, seven, six or seven years old. And so it, uh, as, as more and more students graduate from our undergraduate program, it's gonna have a big impact on the local practice community. And I think that's fantastic. We must continue to support and elevate our students of color so that they can enter the profession with confidence. We are an ideologically pluralistic school, as I mentioned. We're not dogmatic. And so uh, we're open to ideas, cultures, and perspectives from all. We must continue to support this approach, um, uh, th this varied and, and pluralistic approach to architecture. We're a practice-oriented school. Um, so while we're not a vocational school and we're not in interested in, in, in merely producing worker bees for the profession. We're also uh, a proudly pragmatic and technically oriented institute of higher learning. And, uh, and that's something that we've always been good at. Um, our students sit for the exam, they take pride in being licensed and we support that. So we must continue to strike a balance between teaching the why of architecture on one hand and the how of architecture on the other hand. Um, and, and that's something that that balance is something we're committed to. Um, our urban location, we, we thrive on our location in downtown Denver. Um, it provides us with our identity, our purpose, our connection to practice, our connection to community and our diversity. While we may change the modalities of how we deliver our education, um, and we may not always be on site for every class, we may not always be in the classroom for every class, we must maintain our presence in and our connection to the city of Denver. And at the same time, we know that such an important part of what makes Denver, uh, um, Denver and what makes our school our school is the culture of Colorado um, with its people, its landscape and its architecture. Uh, and its architects in, in all parts of the state. We're, we're, we're a school that serves the state of Colorado and the greater Colorado region. And we, we take that, uh, that mandate seriously. It's who we are, it's in our rich history, it's in our legacy of design excellence, and it provides us with our unique qualities. And so um, we, we, need, we must maintain an awareness of this culture and even as we aim um, to, to make change. And we must connect with the communities and friends in greater Colorado because, um, again, we're their architecture school too. And so programs like our Aspen Summer Workshop do this, and we're asking what other programs might expand our connection to the greater uh, practice community in Colorado. And how might um, uh, the remote educational models that I've been describing um, begin to deepen our connections with the Colorado practice community in places like uh, Fort Collins or Aspen or Colorado Springs or other areas of, uh, of Colorado. Um, so these are the things that we, that we believe um, are, are, are foundational and must not change in the architecture school. 
Um, and now I want to um, uh, pass over the presentation to uh, our students, um, and I want to briefly introduce them. Uh, Siomata Amaro is uh, a, a, a current MARC student in our program, in our graduate program, and she is also the president uh, of our National Organization of Minority Students um, here at CU Denver. Um, I'm so proud of everything that Siamata has done in the last year. Uh, she came up to me um, when I uh, did a kickoff presentation at the beginning of the year when I just started and said, um, you know, how can I, how can I get involved? What can I do? Um, I'm inspired by your, your thoughts on, on opening the profession to all. And I, I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of that. And I, I asked her if she wanted to start a chapter of, of NOMA students here at CU Denver, and, and she did it within three or four months. I mean, it was amazing. And so um, I'm, I'm really uh, lucky to, that, that she agreed to, to be part of this presentation. Shane um, is a graduate of our program. He just graduated, um, one, of our, one of our very best uh, graduate students. Uh, an amazing student, but also just a really fantastic person um, who I've learned a lot from. He's our past president of, a, of the AIA-S, uh, AIA Student Organization, and he's gonna present um, uh, on, on behalf of AIA-S um, and, and, and as a student who is going out into the practice community in a really challenging time. Um, and then uh, Justin Trammell, um, I, I just think the world of, he. Uh, he, he was an independent study uh, student of mine over the past semester. Um, we were gonna make all this stuff and then we went remote and so it shifted over to drawing and he handled it uh, beautifully. Um, a fantastic uh, a student who is the president of our Freedom by Design student organization and is entering his last year of the MARC program. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Siomata. Hi, thanks, Mark, for introducing me. That kind of helps me along. Um, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. So my name is Yamara. I'm entering the second year of the three-year master's program. And as Mark mentioned, I'm the current president of our newly founded Noma S chapter at CU Denver. Um, next slide, please. For those who haven't heard me go on and on about NOMA S, NOMA S is a new student org at the College of Architecture and Planning that works to combat the effects of racism in the architecture profession by engaging its members in events, lectures, and community projects. Um, on the right is our mission statement, and below it, I feel that there is. Um, a statement that really speaks to who we are at Noma S and I'll just read it out loud. It's, we add strength to the voice with which we can speak against apathy, bigotry, intolerance, and ignorance, against the abuse of the natural environment and the unempowered, the marginalized, and the disenfranchised. By building a strong organization, we develop a showcase for the excellence and creativity, which has been ignored for so long. Um, if you could go to the next one, please. Did it did it go, Siamana? So on more? the right. Okay. Yep. Uh, on the right uh, is our Noma S board and founders: Jasmine Denard, Bo Lee, James Duran, and Joe Rod. Building this chapter at university, and we want to create a community that is inclusive, as inclusive and diverse. Um, we strive to create strong rules that speak up against inequity and injustice in our profession. Um, next slide, please. With COVID-19 and the growth of the fight for social justice of the past few months, that statement that I earlier never in the college, our students have had to act quickly methods of education and some have been more able to adapt I'm sorry able to adapt more quickly than others because of COVID we see more clearly that marginalized communities face greater challenges there are students and families who have had no choice but to risk their well-being and could working outside of them just to put food on the table or keep the light on issues that can 
because of because of um so because of the concerns of COVID and racial injustice, it can be hard to focus. You have to take care of study. See, Amada, your, um, your, your, your audio is Hello? cutting out. Your, your audio oh, is cutting out. You might want to just re, uh, go repeat what you said for, for this slide. Um, so we can we can sure. hear it because I think it's important. Um, you got it. Um, so because of COVID and racial injustice being more prevalent in the minds of students, so family when need to study, uh, it can be really hard to adapt when you don't have the tools that you need to complete the assignments, and it's hard to design when you worry about the lives of your loved ones every time. So in light of the challenges our students are facing. My team and I have been working to create a means of additional support for our students. To lend a voice to our students that need to be heard, we started by creating a platform where they can speak regarding issues on racial justice. Sorry, am I still being heard? <laughs> Yes. So yeah, you we heard you we heard you okay. that time, Siamata. Thank you. <laughs> so sorry. I'm glad I wanted that to really resonate and uh, yeah. stick. Um, so to lend that voice to our students. Oh, <laughs> to lend that voice to our students, we started by creating a platform on our Noma S C U Denver uh, Instagram page. It's a nine day questionnaire on our page called Nine Minutes. Um, we present nine questions in nine days for the nine minutes that George Floyd was on the ground and fighting for his life. Uh, though we're entering a um, for any sporting woman, I encourage you to give us your voice, opinion, feedback on the Instagram um, or to run to a survey that we'll be sending out to you soon. Along with Nine minutes and the survey that we're working on. Um, we're also building a student lecture series that address these issues. And with technology being a prime participation these days, there's no limit to who we can ask to speak. So we're really excited in building that project. At the end of the last semester and over the summer, I've been in discussions with Shane and Justin, who you'll hear from in a bit, to discuss the opportunity of collaborative lecture series to create a stronger community for our students and invite guests who intersect who intersect the goals of all of our student organizations because noma is technically a body men i'm sorry because noma s is meant to be a body representing our students we strongly support the advocacy and advocism <laughs> activism english is hard and activism our students And so in a list of resources, the resources will include ways to access food, technology, financial support, and even who want students run the need the representation See, while protesting. See, Amada, um, maybe, maybe try, yeah, maybe try turning your video off and maybe the sound will, will have more you bandwidth. You got it. The last thing we heard my clearly <laughs> was about how you partner with other student organizations on, on advocacy and activism. So if you can pick up from there, that would be great. Perfect. Um, so because no mess is to be a representation of our, the diversity of our students, or advocacy and activism that they are participating in, um, where they stand for minoritized, marginalized, franchised communities. To provide our students support on building that list of resources, the list of, the list of resources includes access to food, technology, support, and even who to contact if our students 
we're really eager to celebrate the diversity of our students and Noma S is working to provide them with a support and community where they can find resources that support their education, learn inclusive methods of design, and where they can feel encouraged and proud to use voice to speak for the mind. Shoot, you just completely cut out, see Amada. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll move on to um, to Shane. Um, for some reason, we completely we can't hear you at all. Yeah, I'll, but, I'll private chat with with Giomara and okay, uh, and have her reconnect. Okay, maybe that'll improve the connection. But yeah, let's let's continue onward, and then uh, we want to get to her final thoughts when she can reconnect. Sure, that sounds great. Okay. Um, Shane, you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, so, yeah, so like Mark said, I'm Shane. Um, I'm the past president of our AIS chapter. Um, and then I'll actually be graduating in the fall, so I'm just kind of finishing up here. But um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, yeah, just kind of coming from the AIS perspective, as well as um, just a student within the program as a whole. Um, one of the main questions that arose for me was just um, kind of pondering how we could continue to support students professionally um, and still bridge that gap between academia and the field while ensuring that students are still getting the most productive and positive qualities that they normally would get from these in-person environments. Um, so then on the next slide, um, kind of following the same format that Mark has set up really nicely for us was um, beginning to address what must change. Um, so kind of looking to specifically AAS as a chapter and us as a support system for students and getting out into the workplace. Um, when we kind of first began this transition this previous semester to the virtual environment, we found that there were some things that we were already doing that would be able to switch over to online with ease and not really have to sacrifice anything in regards to um, the student experience. So a lot of our lunch and learns, lectures, and panel discussions inherently held visibility for um, kind of getting the same thing that you would get out of in person as you would virtually. And um, kind of one of the silver linings that we began to discover really is that um, there becomes an increased accessibility with some of these events. Um, so now that they're online, they have the ability to be recorded and referred back to later. And so that there's kind of becomes this shared um, available knowledge that you're able to access anytime. Um, and just kind of being able to pinpoint some of these more seamless um virtual to in-person and vice versa that um kind of makes developing contingency plans for the next year's board um a lot less overwhelming um because there's just already so much that's going on in this world and having to develop a plan a and a plan b for what might happen in next fall is really hard so um this is kind of a nice component to that and then on the next slide um it does get a little more, um, a little harder, um, just kind of um, pinpointing some of those events that require a bit more finesse and recalibration in terms of those more tactile experiences. So firm tours, crawls, um, networking events, critiques, charrettes. Um, there's a richness that really comes from these events because of their in-person component. Um, so the, the question then kind of becomes, how do we continue to make the switch to the virtual env environment while retaining um, this richness that kind of comes with it? And not to say that I have all the answers to this, because I certainly don't, but um, there are a couple things that we're looking at just to kind of still get at these. And I think as this past year's board and the next year's board kind of continues with this dialogue, there's really a great opportunity for a productive collective brainstorm on how we could still give these students these experiences and um, give them opportunities to collaborate 
um, opportunities to network with individuals and a lot of the faculty at the school is also already doing this as well. So it's really awesome to have that support. And then on the next slide, um, this is kind of shifting more towards the what must not change. So some of those, um, Mark kind of already touched on some of these insights, but I think it's important to reiterate these from a student perspective, um, just on some of these qualities that are inherently at risk of being lost with moving to the virtual environment. Um, so collaboration being one of those. And I think what I've noticed as we switched over to um, the online starting in March, not only um, just from student orgs, but just in the academic um, environment, um, I think some of the studios have done really well with finishing out the past semester, just with pinpointing certain technologies that allowed for this type of engagement to continue despite the physical separation. Um, so I would imagine that some of you are familiar with Miro. It's basically an online whiteboard. And I think what's really awesome about this is that um, this media has the potential to become a living archive, which is all in one place that is essentially permanently preserved. Um, so I know I personally have had the tendency, depending on how the semester would ramp up, um, you could sometimes get disorganized and be shuffling around for your notes. And it's just nice to be able to look back even six months, a year, just onto this one page and has basically your stream of consciousness from that whole semester all collapsed on one page. Um, so I think that's a technology that can really be um, utilized even more with studios and with student groups and with mentoring and any basically any other type of event um, or experience. So I think this is a really awesome platform that we could begin to uh, use a lot more as well. Um, and then on my final slide, um, just the other quality that really must not change is um, the inherent need to maintain and build relationships with our peers and with professional networks. And obviously Zoom is a fantastic resource for this. Um, and I think that the college and especially Rachel Brown, which uh, Mark has also talked about earlier, who's our director of mentorship and internship has done a really fantastic job at curating panel discussions that allow for the students to interact with professionals on the field. And I think as the mentor program begins to lift off even more, I think that there's a really great chance for this um, maintaining of the connections and the contacts to really um, continue. So um, I think that the school has been doing a pretty fantastic job just in general, trying to make sure that we're not losing too much out on the things that we would get in person. And I think, just as a past president looking to the next year's board, kind of um, I feel comfortable and confident that things will be able to continue even more strongly um, given how everything has been handled so far. So. Great. Thank you, Shane. Um, Justin, uh, we can hopefully um, move through this quick. So we would have a few minutes for questions at the end. Yeah, no, no problem. That's, that's good for me. Sounds um, good. Thanks. Okay. Well, well hi everybody. Um, my name is Justin Trammell and um, I'm a, in my second year of the three year program at the, at the school. And I just wanted to touch briefly on some of the different programs happening at the college and just kind of how things have changed and how these groups have navigated the pandemic. Um, so first um, is the Colorado Center for Community Development. Um, that's a program of a collaboration between uh, the College of Architecture and Planning and the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. And the goal there is to give uh, design work to rural and, and small communities that might otherwise not have access to design work. Um, so as many of you might know, is the transition to team meetings digitally has been um, the use of a lot of different um, platforms, kind of what Shane was also talking about. So at the CCCD, there's been 
changes in the scheduling of our um, team meetings, how we share content, whether it's through email or Miro or other services, and also this how we give feedback to one another um, when we move from the analog to the digital. Okay, so the next slide. Um, so one of the you know big changes that has happened is uh, the change with presentations to the community. So here's a photo of an in-person community presentation. Uh, since the pandemic, the CCCD has moved to a digital uh, client communication. Um, and that has been primarily the use of Zoom. And some of the things that have kind of come out from this service that's kind of interesting is the kind of attendance increase from community members. I think people don't have to travel now that the service is done um, online. So we're actually seeing more people participate in the meetings. Uh, the experience for the community members has changed in a way that people might be more engaged. Um, they're able to see the content on their screen rather than a projector. Uh, they can print out a PDF of design work. Um, and also the engagement piece where people are able, able to use services like chats and whatnot to communicate. Okay, next slide. And then lastly here is we've also been experimenting with uh, video production. Um, and that's a way for us to pre-record content and design work for communities, uh, give them that video so that can live in different um, platforms, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or their own website. Um, and that also gives the ability for the community to do things like surveys where we can, as a group, um, aggregate data from the community members of what kind of designs they would like, uh, get that kind of feedback that might be anonymous, um, it might be more accessible to some individuals, and then as a team we can go through those metrics and report back to the community. Okay, next slide. And then looking at the uh, design build program at the college, um, uh, we the project that was uh, what we did last semester was working with the Auraria campus on two bike shelters. Um, those bike shelters would have access for for students or anyone that would be able to get registered um, and safely house bikes, house skateboards. And it also included uh, fix-it stations for bike maintenance. Okay, next slide. So the here's a kind of a little diagram of the kind of sequence of how the program typically worked. Uh, we start in the fall semester with a lot of pre-design, uh, move into uh, the schematic construction set, and then mock-ups have been a big part of the design build process. Uh, next slide. So the, the change this semester with the pandemic is that the pandemic occurred basically right at the moment that the, that the group was doing mock-ups. And the mock-ups typically would inform the design process and modification. So what the group ultimately focused on is fabrication drawings and animations. So fabrication drawings were, were there for students to get more detailed analysis of their own construction element for the project and share that with um, with uh, contractors or or consultants to get a better idea of that construction element um, actually go ahead and next slide mark so here's an example of a fabrication drawing done by a, a construction team for the design build program uh, the project used uh, steel louvers and limestone louvers to to be the main kind of wall system for the structure um, so that team the wall team dived deeper into uh, the the drawing element of understanding how the louvers may be constructed and then there was a communication with the fabricator of these drawings of how that would ultimately get done uh, next slide And then this is um, showing that we also spent a lot of time working on animations. So kind of a unique element of the digital world where students were able to think about the construction sequence, how things are put together, what the exact order is, and understand a little bit more deeply the details of the construction sequence. 
So the image here is kind of, and that was both done in a, a micro and a macro kind of view. So here's kind of a macro view of the of the project where students looked at each large phase of the roof construction. Okay, next slide. And then this quickly, you know, the you know the the program is really immersed. Like students spend a lot of time on campus, working with each other, learning from each other. So that ultimately changed because of the remote nature of after the pandemic. So I think there was a reliance heavily on the team to schedule full group meetings, uh, small team meetings, uh, reliance on group messaging with the phone during non kind of studio hours, as well as the use of video streaming to show um, if someone is working on a mock up in their own backyard, we have one student that was able to show the whole class kind of their process in that specific construction. Okay, then the last uh, program I'll touch quickly on is uh, Freedom by Design. Um, so that's a this to the service arm for AIS um, at the school, and it's a new it's a new um, student group that was started last year, and this this current year was our first year working with a client and and doing design and build work. Um, so our client was Same Cafe. They're a, a really cool cafe on Colfax. And they, they are a pay-as-you-can food service for that community. Okay, next slide. So I think as we've kind of mentioned is the, us as a student group had a transition to this digital organization. I think ultimately we found that there was an efficiency to breaking into small groups to identify some leaders to take on those small groups. Um, and and also utilize some of those digital platforms to communicate to the client. Okay, next slide. And then the ultimate goal of the project was to do renovation of the cafe. Uh, we were planning on doing it at the end of the semester um, because the pandemic things were slowed, but we are currently looking at the summer months as a time to go in and, and work with the cafe and we're building opportunities for volunteers to work either on site if they're comfortable, but also find activities for volunteers to do remotely uh, during the summer. Okay, I think uh, Chimata's back and um, we, we lost you there momentarily, but um, I'm sure that hasn't happened to anyone on this call and any <laughs> experience they've had since they've gone remote. So uh, we wanna let uh, let you finish up uh, your thoughts because I know they're important. Thank you. I'll keep my video off just in case. Um, I just wanted to wrap up. You've heard our, you've heard Shane and Justin and the like real depths that uh, our student leaders are um, pushing to help our students. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if it was heard, but the list that NOMAS is helping provide for our students uh, includes ways to access food technology and financial support, and even who to contact if our students need legal representation while protesting. And we're really eager to help, help celebrate the diversity of our students and all, through all three organizations that you've heard. Um, and create that community where they can find resources of support that support their education, where they can learn inclusive methods of design and where they can feel encouraged and proud to use their voice. Um, thank you for letting me uh, come back um, and I'll give it to Mark. Thanks, Yamada. Um, do we, uh, I, I don't think we have very much, very much time, unfortunately, um, for too many questions, but um, happy to happy to take questions if uh, if anybody has them. Sure, and and if uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that bandwidth works here. So if you want to bring your video back up, um, team, um, and we Jamato, we heard you loud and clear, so that worked out really well. Yeah, um, yeah, that was great. So let's see, just some questions I had. Uh, well, first of all, Mark, this is a great panel you put together. Um, and it's just a small representation of the quality of students that have um, come to the school. And we appreciate, appreciate you bringing them together. Um, and I totally hear you on the 
on the transition away from making visits. Uh, those were the highlights of, of my weeks as well. And I had a whole yeah. slew of them on my calendar and they just sort of went poof. Uh, so that's been yeah. a real bummer. Um, but it, what often happened was I was either there right after you or they would say, oh, I'm, and I'm looking forward to meeting Mark next week. So we were kind of piggybacking off of each other. And I heard a lot of great things about um, what the school's doing from those practitioners. And, and there's a ton of alumni from the program uh, all over the state. So um, you're having an impact. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it. It's really one of my favorite parts of being being uh, in in this privileged position is is going out and in meeting with all the fantastic architects in in Denver. And I was really looking forward this summer to spending time driving up to Aspen and driving up to down to Colorado Springs and other places to meet some of the architects in the other parts of the state. And so I look forward to having the opportunity to do that. But um, it's yeah, it's challenging right now. Let's just hope it's a rain check. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, Shimana, I wanted to follow up with one of the things you mentioned. Um, could you share in the, Insta uh, the Instagram channel that you have in the chat in case people want to see that? I'm, I think they're especially interested in those uh, nine questions and some of the responses that came back on that. Absolutely. I really hope that the students contribute and I hope everybody sees and hears their voices. They've contributed some amazing stuff to um, to, to the questions we've posed. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'll put that in the chat. And then also you've got um, a resource page for both for COVID-19 and on the protests and the recent racial unrest that's happening. Um, I'd love for you to connect with our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusiveness Committee at AI Colorado, because we also have resource pages uh, for those same topics as well. So um, it would be great to cross-populate those two pages so that we have I love uh, that. Yeah. A, a, total, a more comprehensive view of all the things that are available to people. I absolutely love that. Yeah, I will definitely get in contact. Great, thanks. Um, Shane, I noticed Chris Shears in one of the photos. That must have been just a miserable use of your time. Um, <laughs> My studio so, professor for Studio 5, so we're pretty close. <laughs> I'm totally joking, of course. Uh, what, a, what a great mentor. Can you talk about um, what role practitioners like Chris uh, play in helping to um, mentor students, prepare them for the next stage in their, in their career? Um, I think there's, there was just a nice um, just balance between like pedagogy and practicality that I had with his studio, especially. Um, Cause I know sometimes in school we can kind of like get up in the clouds. So it was just nice to kind of, because before that studio, I wasn't really working like in an actual firm. So just be able to understand a little more of what it was actually like um, mm -hmm. was huge because the, I think I find myself seeing that there's like a little bit of a gap between um, what we're doing in school versus what's actually occurring once we get out into the workplace. So having those um, mentors that were able to guide us through that transition are like extremely huge, so. And we had a great conversation, seems like forever ago, um, on ways to have AIA and AIS work together. So um, I hope we can pick that back up pretty soon. Uh, Justin, I was particularly taken by your, your point about how there's been more participation online. Um, so it, while it, it's not the same kind of feel, it allows more access to those conversations. And I, I totally want to validate that. I was able to watch my daughter's final crit presentation on her master's thesis by Zoom. Um, I would have had to get on a plane and travel there. Uh, and they might not have even let me anyway, you know, as a, as a parent. So that was surreal for all involved. Um, but I guess that's one of the silver linings, right? Is, is it's a way to expand the audience. And do you see the, the climate that we're in with this remote learning accelerating ways to invite more stakeholders into the process or maybe making the, the visual, the visualization of these ideas more accessible? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and, and I agree. I think we're all, very accustomed to Zoom and some of the functionality that we see in these platforms. Um, 
I, I do think in moving in forward, you know, I think there's a digital literacy that will probably expand for, for community members. Um, you know, the CCCD works with rural communities. So I think there's kind of a double-edged sword where people that might have computers, you know, as a privilege and then or literacy can navigate Zoom or other functions. But I think it also may um, drop some people in the background as well. So there might be a need for there to be kind of like an educational level um, and hopefully maybe things outside of Zoom will kind of bubble up and we'll see kind of support from the private technological arena to kind of give more options to like different demographics of people. And Mark, do you, do you see the pedagogy itself changing uh, or is it just a different delivery method? I mean, a lot of these schools go back, I mean, the, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts model started in 1648. So the studio culture has changed very incrementally over the years. Um, is this yeah. one of those inflection points where it's going to change drastically or is it just a pause until we get back to business as usual? Um, I hope it's not just a pause until we get back to business as usual, because I think there's a lot of uh, great things about it, but there's also a lot of problems with it. And um, I, I, you know, I also hope that we do challenge our pedagogy. I think our pedagogy has been really narrow and really uh, ex exclusive um, for a long time. And uh, if you look at the new national uh, architectural accreditation standards, they're wanting us to expand how we teach the history of architecture, for example, and who are the, who are the, who, what are some of the readings that we engage with? Who are the, some of the theorists we engage with? And um, I think those are, those are really good changes and they're going to impact um, architecture in some really profound and I think needed ways, because again, it's a, it, it it's a, it, architecture, had, you know, this came up yesterday in the conversation um, with the with the panelists, um, uh, Siamata, Larry, and and uh, Flurry, um, that uh, you know we've we've been we've been kind of uh, it, we architecture has has evolved into a, a very um, uh, rarefied and and but also a uh, uh, very uh, exclusionary um, practice that's inaccessible to so many people and I, I think that um, some of the changes that that this will prompt will ad address that problem in architecture in in a good way um, and I, I you know I think part of the problem is is that culture that we have um, not not everybody has the privilege of staying up all night in in studio uh um to the exclusion of work and family um you know that's that's something that that i was able to do because i came from a, a, a point of privilege i didn't have to work when i was in in college most of our students hold down um, significant jobs while they're in school and many of our students have family responsibilities that that I didn't have when I was in school and so we need to change our approach and we need if if we if we want to really put our money where our mouth is in terms of opening architecture to everybody we we need to change the way that we educate and the way that we teach because it doesn't work for everybody yeah and then we can't expect the demographics of the student body to change as long as the nature of receiving that education is so time, energy, and money intensive. Yep. And thank you, by the way, for um, having uh, Anicia as one of your lecturers. She was a um, really great participant yesterday in, in that panel and had a lot to share about what's happening at the school as well. Um, yeah, so she's question, fantastic. How's the the building entry lobby project going? Was that put on hold or or is it still progressing? Yeah, it sort of put on hold. We're we're working on it over the summer. Um, we're we're kind of refining what the students had designed in the studio, um, and we've hired a student to work on it over the summer. And then the hope is we can't really do the build project right now because of the the lockdown on campus. But we hope that we'll be able to build a project either this fall or maybe um, next spring. So it's still going. It's just uh, kind of delayed for a little while. And if you could but, tell. Tell yeah. the audience what, what yeah. 
from yes. the next time they, they see the campus. Yeah, yeah. Once you're able to come back on campus, please, please do. And, um, you know, we've renovated floor two and we've renovated um, uh, parts of floor three. And, and I think uh, we've renovated some other floors in the CU uh, building um, where the College of Architecture and Planning is. But the lobby, oof, it's still like, uh, you know, from the 19... 70s or 80s and uh it it does not look like a design school so we we are uh we're we're redesigning starting with redesigning the security desk where we're uh in the lobby where students first walk in and then we'll we'll kind of work on other parts of it as we have time and resources to do it but it'll be a much needed uh overhaul of that space and it'll mm -hmm. it'll be exciting i think um what we're what we're planning is going to be fantastic and it'll give a new face to the school yeah, that's certainly important in the design curriculums. Um, I was doing yeah. college visits with my son who wanted to study uh, graphic and industrial design. And it was almost a automatic thumbs down if the building that it was in was really terrible. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know, if, if you can't design a good place for a design school, yeah, not a great sign. But yeah, I'm and this this, for this is uh, taking steps to improve it. Yeah, this slide actually is a great example. This is a picture of our brand new outfitted uh, studio space on floor two. So this is all brand new furniture from, I think from Steelcase. And uh, um, we partnered with them and were able to, um, to work with them to, to, get, to get this new furniture. And then we're working with, um, some some local uh, designers and fabricators to design some uh, breakout uh, some breakout countertops that go around this space. So it's going to be uh, uh, just a fantastic new new space. Well, we got one question from the audience, and then I'll I'll wrap up with one for everybody to participate in. Um, I think this one might might be for you, Mark. Um, What's the theoretical stance behind the current pedagogy? And it, it may have been triggered by, you said that we don't make the choice between theory and practice. We want mm -hmm. a practical piece to it. Um, the theoretical stance behind the current pedagogy. Um, I would say, uh, you know, we're, we're really invested in, as I mentioned earlier, in materials and making. And from a theoretical, from a theoretical perspective, I would say probably we would lean on some of the, some of the, the theoretical work um, of, uh, of, of uh, Palasma and some of the phenomenologists who, um, uh, really uh, write about and consider um, the the kind of uh, tactility and, and meaning behind um, materials. Um, I know uh, there are many of our faculty who are big fans of people like uh, Peter Zumthor, um, but then you know we need to open, we need to crack that open, and we need to to include others. Uh, there's a fantastic uh, woman um, from South America. Um, uh, named Lena uh, Bombardi, who is an amazing architect, uh, and and um, you know her her work um, studies materials and making in 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 profound and new ways. Um, so I, I think you know how we ask questions through making, how we how we uh, in, interrogate the discipline through making um, drives a lot of our pedagogy. Um, and, and you're, we're in a transition moment. You know, I hesitate to bring up a lot of the theorists who we've been reading because I think they're the same old, same old theorists that we've been reading for the last, uh, you know, 50 years. And, um, you know, you, it's fantastic to read up Robin Evans on, on the theory of, of representation. Um, and that's someone who drives a lot of our work or, um, or, or, or others, but, you know, you go down the list and they're all, they're all white men. And so um, I think we're, we're in, we're in the process of disrupting that and dismantling that. And so it's a, it's a tough question to answer because I think uh, there, there are many out there that we're in the process of, of discovering and understanding who will shift our, 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 the theoretical stance behind our pedagogy. Yeah, I think that's a moment that, that the profession at all levels is having right now. Um, 
and it's it's got to start in architecture school as well. You know, if all the the leading lights and precedents are pale, male, and stale, mm -hmm. uh, you can't simply change and and feature all a different cast of characters if you're still studying works in Rome and Greece. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not just about who are we learning from and looking to for inspiration, but what are the contexts in which architecture is produced and, and how is it influenced by the local culture? Um, so I, I hope that it'll also be looking at um, different kinds of, of models of making and producing architecture instead of just the European influence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm personally interested in um, marginal marginal making practices like those uh, at, in the mediated matter group that that is led by Neri Oxman at MIT um, you know uh, making that is uh, a partnership with biology and um, that that that's inspirational for me and drives a lot of a lot of my work um, so I yeah I think we need to we need to find the the unlikely unusual suspects who are who are doing uh, pushing pushing the discipline in new ways and and there there are lots of them out there and you're making more every day um, we've yeah got, we've got three that we've seen right now so um, yeah. I want to ask uh, before we go um, what one thing would our students ask um, practitioners who are listening today to do to help make a better connection between you as a, as a student or a recent graduate and the profession that you're about to enter into other than a job offer um, we'll just say up front that's that's one so what is the second thing you would ask practitioners uh, to do uh if i might uh, i guess partially this is through the noma s lens but i would ask practitioners how um, maybe ask them to consider how their own bias um, is perpetuating the problem that's happening today. Um, it's, that would be my first question. And I guess the follow up question would be how they are um, furthering kind of this need for diversity and um, inclusive, inclusive practices uh, in their firm. Justin or Shane? Yeah, I, I guess maybe um, to piggyback on a little bit, I would also like to ask the practice, you know, is it important to how they're choosing the clients that they're working with? So I think architects by working with certain kind of clients and feeling themselves through that, we were building the world, mirroring those clients' needs. So I guess I would ask like, is there a way for architecture as a discipline to reach out and find those clients and the people that are usually not really raised as a focal point for our discipline? Good thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna keep on the same page because I think that's just so extremely pressing as of right now. And just with the types of, with any project that's getting taken on is like, what are all the stakeholders that are getting involved, not just the client, like who's the community that is getting this project that it's getting placed in. And I think there's, so many like external effects that happen with like any type of building other than it just getting placed on the site and like there's can be ripple effects based on like what it is and i think it's making sure that everyone kind of has a voice in the project i think is extremely important so yeah i think it's a it's an ideal time for those conversations to happen as well as we think about think about cities in response to public health crisis or, or societal shifts and, and um, just justice as a lens um, altogether. So um, all three of those comments are, are timely and relevant and inspirational. So thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, Mark, great, great lineup. Shane, Justin, Shamara, um, nice work and keep it up. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, thanks everybody who who came and listened. Um, I know you're being bombarded with a lot of these things um, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, and it's hard to do so many Zoom meetings. But we appreciate all of you who came, and I want to thank our students too. It was just fantastic to have your voices here today. Okay. Well, um, if you could, before you go, put your name in the chat just to double check and reinforce uh, that learning unit credit. Um, so we get that recorded for you. And then coming up next week, we've got two programs that you may be interested in. On Tuesday, we have a session we're calling Marketing in the Time of Coronavirus, featuring a panel of marketing experts to give you advice and tips for business development during this time. Um, it's probably as important now as it's ever been. And then next Wednesday, our Sustainability Working Group is hosting a follow-up to the overview of the 2030 commitment. So AI Colorado members whose firms have taken on this challenge will report some of their efforts, uh, the, the challenges and successes that they've had along the way um, at being a 2030 commitment firm. So that's next week, Tuesday and Wednesday at noon. Uh, we hope to see you then. And if not, we'll see you uh, elsewhere in the real or the virtual world. Thanks everybody on the panel and all of our attendees today. We appreciate your time.